So welcome back. Now after lunch, we'll try to have this uh, session a bit similar to the morning. So we'll start off with some uh, more geeky technical side and then go to the more creative ending, although it will be creative ending with graphs. So we'll see what that will be nice also to hear. Um, so this morning, uh, afternoon session will be focusing on InDesign. So why do you need another in, uh, tool like InDesign when now Illustrator is such a great, fantastic software, as I've been trying to push this? Uh, but there's actually things that Illustrator doesn't do very well. And it's not meant to do these things either. So one thing that where I hear a lot of frustration from people is when they try to do things in Illustrator that actually are meant to be done in InDesign as well. So for example, if you're trying to put together a poster, so the, the idea is then not to make the poster in Illustrator, but actually do it in InDesign. The, so they come from two very different historical sides, that the Illustrator was to make a single illustration and then bring that to something else. In design comes from the book building, book generating business of uh, putting together large uh, areas of text, putting in images, putting headers, footers, footnotes, <coughs> references, uh, type styles, things that go through a whole book. And in design has this great scalability. It works well from doing a small figure up to a thousand page book. So you can think about that uh, one as really everywhere from, from the single figure that you will put into something else in up to your whole thesis. And it can really manage all that process. So in InDesign in you can work with it either as your uh, um, text editor and start writing things in it or you can see it of the tool that brings all other things into it. And I prefer the latter, that you actually get all your data sorted in other uh, software, that Word is an excellent word processor, so you should use Word for working on your text until the bitter end. And I may not have time today to show you how to bring in the text into InDesign, but it's really a great tool for that as well. And you can use things that come in with the references from your text editor. So a heading that is called heading one in Word can really become the heading you want it to be in InDesign as well. And you can update the text from Word and it will update <coughs> but retain your new heading styles that are in InDesign. So you can move back and forth also with text in InDesign. But where it really shines is where where you're bringing all photos and illustrations into one concept. And I thought more than uh, sort of talking about it, I'll show you just one case of when you do that in InDesign. And InDesign is structurally very similar to Illustrator and Photoshop. When you, when you look at it, you actually sometimes have to double check that you're actually in InDesign. And it's the most visual thing is actually just that uh, everything is lighter in the newer version. So I'll just reset this to get started. But otherwise, you see the basic concept of the software is, is really similar. You have a little bit more of these toolbars on the top that makes it easy for you to do adjustments and layouts and other things. But otherwise, many of your basic tools function exactly the same way. So much of the things that you learn in Illustrator you can take with you to InDesign. That also has some risks to it because um, you can draw illustrations in InDesign but it's not great for that. So, so don't, get, don't get tempted to do everything in InDesign. Use Illustrator to make your illustrations and then place them back into InDesign. Then you use the both tools in the way that they are the best to do that. So today I thought I, I will try to do a montage of images just to show you how to work with this. And it's uh, interesting now to do that because the montage I want to show you is exactly the opposite of 
uh, what Annika talked to you about earlier today. So this is the type of uh, standard multi-panel montage in, uh, in a journal article that we sort of love to hate. But the reality is that this is often what we end up doing. And just to show you what we have to work with here, I'll, I try to just show you this as a sort of continuum from what we worked on before. So you have, in this case, I have some bright field images, I have some confocal images, I have immunofluorescent images. These are all the raw image data. They have not been manipulated in any way. And this is what I propose to you to do, to not focus is this really, has it a nice uh, white balance that I prefer, has it, try to do the best original data you have, then forget about the images until the end of the montage. Because then you see exactly which images you are going to use, which fit well, where you crop it, and that may change. So that you may have had a very dark area in, in your image, but it turns out when you did the montage, that's cropped away. So you didn't have to do anything about that. Uh, and so many things you will save time by not manipulating, manipulating the images until the end. And it also has other advantages that I'll come to when it comes to scaling and scale bars and things. The other parts that I'll put in are these figures that I showed you how to extract before. So we have one graph from Illustrator. That was the graph that we generated in SPSS. And now it looks like this. So it, it was done the things that I showed you how to do to contract it sideways and make the error bars uh, unidirectional. But otherwise, it's sort of just cleaned up. And it looks roughly in the proportion that, that I like. And the other thing was the, the qPCR data we got out from the other document that just showing what you can do when you have that type of vector graphics in layout. And it's sort of partly takes in uh, what Annika said as well. If you can bring in text to where you have your data, you can make it much more clear what is what, wh what you're supposed to read where. And so that's the data from the uh, qPCR. So these things are just now all stored in one folder. And you want to get started with make, making this multi-panel montage. And what I prefer, and this is, again, sort of a matter of taste, is to think, what is your outer box when you make this montage? And we are, unfortunately, quite locked into how you're uh, submitting your figures. It should be a single column, a double column, one and a half column sometimes. But it's good to think about, what can this start off as being? So in this case, you would start doing a new document. And that, in my case, I want to do a single column figure for a manuscript. So then you say that, well, normally they would be somewhere 80, uh, 87 millimeters wide. So it depends on your journal. But, and then just have a full height version of this. And you see here, this is meant to make a full document layout. But in this case, we're not going to do that. So we don't care about having any margins. So you make zero margins in that. So now we have our box where we have to sort of fit in our data into it. And then you need to think about what images do I put in here? And there, there are many different ways to do this. But I prefer thinking about what is the total data you want to show and what components are of that. So in this case, we have uh, three modalities of microscopy. You have a bright field image of a treatment site and a, and a lesion site, if I go back to here. And you have confocal data being red, green, and merged, and also immunofluorescent being the same thing, red, green, and merged. So what I do is to start with the merged data and the treatment data. So I don't take in all images from the start. And I'll show you why this is a good idea. So then when you have this, you use the place command as we used before, and make sure that you go into the right folder here, and we have this montage. So I'll start with my bright field, and I start with then the transduced side of this. And then you can have show import options and many other options here that we will skip for now. And this places your image, and they may look huge, because the 
this software takes in the target resolution of the image. And in this case, it was 72 dpi. So you shouldn't be at all worried by this being so big, because it's just that resolution was given by the camera that acquired this image. It still has a good resolution, and it will be perfect when you scale it down. But it just shows this image very large. And that can often happen. But of course, we have our um, scaling and transform that is now put in this uh, up here. In, in, in design, it has an other way of scaling and cropping images. And this can be confusing from the start. So if I just take the corner of this image, you would actually think sorry, that it would start scaling it if I pull down this corner. And with space uh, shift, you would have it proportionally scaled. But it doesn't work that way. As you see here, it actually crops the image there. So to scale it, you have two different options. You have to scale it with a scaling tool, which is the free transform tool down here, or you do it with the transform toolbox. But again, in the transform toolbox, you cannot use the size constraints here. So if I would say, well, this is now 564 millimeters, I want to make this 100 millimeters wide, it actually crops the image there also. So these are cropping tools that you have up here. They make the bounding box of your images. So there you do not want to scale it. Where you want to scale it is actually in those two where it says 100%. So that is actually changing your image size. So what you can do now is to say, I am going to have two panels next to each other. I want to have a spacing in between, say that that spacing is 1.5 millimeters. So you can start off saying, now I want to make this a full two column width. I make this 87 millimeters, as that's my full width. And then you can say, well, now I want to make this 87 minus 1.5 millimeters, because that will be my um, spacing in between my images. And then I'll just divide this by two. And now I know I have an image that two of identical sides next to each other will make a 1.5 millimeter spacing. So now you have done a lot of your work already there. And I put it up into the top. In the next one, I'll place a confocal image just below this one. And, or sorry, I just take a immunofluorescent. And then I start with the, the composite, the merge of red and green channels. And I place that one. And now, of course, that one is also huge. So I can just redo the same structure, 87 millimeters. Um, I'll take it 87 millimeters minus, and now it will be two spaces. So then I take three millimeters there. And then divide this by three. And this is where it's really good to use the uh, sort of the classical mathematics and divide it by three. Don't write 33% because it will not be exact. So just go 100 divided by three and you will have a perfect width on these guys. So now you may say, well, this is actually not the way I want to view these images. I want to have them square. But then you have now your width being 28 millimeters, you really want that to be the size uh, in the width, but you want it square. So then you can reuse this 28 millimeters and just put it into the height instead. Say I want to make it that size and then move back to the width here. So when I put in 28 millimeters here, you will see that it now crops it to a square. So it retains the proportion of the image just crops it into a square. What happens to the rest of that image data? It's not lost at all. You still have it in here. And you can see that by then using the direct selection tool, the one that is, has a white center. And when you hover, you now see the full image data to the sides here. And then you can start to move this side to side, keeping down the shift. And I can place this exactly how I want it. So I may want it a bit more 
to, uh, on the left side of that whole image rather than to the right. Mm -hmm. But it's still all is there in this one. And that has some uh, great values that I'll get back to you later on. So now we have two very basic images here. And then I want to see the first one here. I'm actually only interested in the substantia nigra here. I don't really care about the reticulata and the peduncle below. So I want to focus in on this. I can then use the same uh, direct selection tool. And you see that this now becomes red. And then I can go in here and scale and pull this up. And then you see that it's actually scaling the image within that box. So it keeps the crop the same way, and you can just scale this up. So see, this is where it's really good to maintain all your data, not crop it before, because then you can really see this is the size I want to have it, and I can now see that it's very much of a waste to have this box this size. So then I can go out and click with the black arrow again and just start to trim away. And I trim this to a place where you are happy with it. You may want to have say in this case, maybe a little bit more on the reticulata to show where you are located, but say that you're happy with that. So now you've quickly generated something that fits. Then we have the question of scale bars, and this is a place that people, I think, always bring in a little bit too late, but that you've so done this and say, crap, I needed a scale bar, and you hunt down where you have that scaling. And so I have three tips to do that. Um, the most straightforward version is when you look at this image here, it actually had a scale bar down in a place where I knew I cropped away. So there it's trivial. Then you can just copy this one, place it next to here, and it has the same size as this, and you just trace on that a line. And you want to make sure that your uh, scale bars are actually as the independent objects in InDesign, because that gives you the freedom of cropping. And so don't burn them into your images if you're not certain that you don't want that area in your, in your data, because it's, it really limits you to how you want this to look in the end. So when, when you have done that scale bar, then you can just make this into a, a two point and probably in this case a white one. But make sure that you have your scale bar in your data at an early point. So it follows all your latter modifications. Because once it's here and you can group it together, then, then you're sure that that scale bar will retain the right size. In other cases, you may not be as lack lucky. So there, um, it's good to look at your acquisition tool again, because they may give you two different options. In many uh, microscopy imaging software today, they, it actually shows you how many microns each pixel is. And there it's a simple thing that you can just, sorry, if I put my links here, um, and I show you that up here. Let's see if I can actually expand this slightly. So get the full name, yes. So what I normally do is just to write in here what your pixel size is in this image. So here you know that it's actually 1.75 micrometers per pixel. And you know here that this is 600, uh, 1,600 microns in width, the original image. And that's actually all data you need to generate uh, a scale bar. Because then you can take your direct tool, select the whole image, and then you get your width of this image is 57 millimeters. So I can make now a bar, and I know that 57 is um, times 1.75 divided by 1600 is a micron in this scaling. So then by doing that on this line, I can get this 57, what did we say, times 1.75, and then I divide this by 16, and then you get 100 microns long. So just by knowing those parameters, you can easily then generate an accurate scale bar that is on the micron correct. 
So you don't have to sort of approximate just because you only have that figure, because you have all the other data in here that you need. So just make this two and call it. Another trick is if you don't have these things, but you're working with confocal images, you may actually have luck that you have this data in the image. And I'll show you that alternative as the third image here. So when you place and you go into a, a confocal, uh, a raw data here, see, sorry, I can take this one, and just place that one. So now we can do the same. We know that 28 millimeters is what we want for a square one. So I'll just put this one in 28 millimeters. So that was leaving the artboard because it's too far out. I lost my image. Here it is. <laughs> Sometimes it moves out. Um, so you, you now see I'm not at all uh, caring where I place this, but now I have an image here that I don't know anything about the scale of this one. So there's a trick, that if you select the image and you go to your links, so this is where it has the reference to the original, you can choose to open this in the application bridge. So we haven't talked much about bridge, but bridge is this software that can show you a lot of information and parameters. So for raw confocal images, it's not uncommon that they use something called file headers to put a lot of useful information in. And the file headers is just a small database that is in within each file. And you can see that here when you show them, that here in, in the header, you have all of this description. And so this is for your confocal, and many of these things are sort of very complicated, you may not want to see, but so you have the size of, of this, what user it was, when it was uh, collected, what scanning mm -hmm. mode, all of these things that can be very useful if you want to repeat this. But also in here, what you see further down is that you have the full size of your whole, whole image. So there you see that this actually is a 70, 750 microns wide that was collected there. So by doing that, then you can easily go back in here copy my scale bar with the alt shift here, get it down, just bring it to the front. And then I know that 28 uh, was 750, so if I want to have this 250, I'll divide it by 3. Um, so then we can do this 28 millimeters uh, divided by 3. So that, sorry, it should be 28 divided by 3 millimeters. And you see that that is huge, but you may then divide this by 2.5. And you have a 100 micrometer scale bar. So they, uh, that can save you a lot of time also to find that one out. Because then you don't have to go back to your confocal and retake the image or fi finding it out in some, some other, um, through other means. So now you have just created the scale bars and the images here. And before you start loading all the other images, um, my tip to you is that you actually start to prepare your lettering. And lettering in InDesign is always done with text boxes. So you put in a box, and you can make this box any size you want. So the size I prefer to aim at, sorry, here. Um, I don't want to scale in. So we'll just scale into this. Here, assuming. So you can start to make text boxes and my recommendation is that you make a text box that actually is half the width of, of the image like this, just as your crude start. And you put that this will probably be A, B, C, D, E, let's say that. So you make an E here. And so you can change the fonts individually, um, just make this semi-bold. Oh, that's not the one. This is not your typical font. Uh, myriad, and then make this semi-bold. So, and then we'll make that one white with our color. So, so now you have your E up in the top here. What you don't want to do is say, well, let's move this one down there, and it looks perfect. That will be very annoying for you to work with in the future. 
What you do instead is that you have something called the text frame options here. Within that text frame options, you can now set exactly your spacing from every place. So I can say my top should be, say, 1.2 millimeters, and it will put that spacing on all edge, edges like this. So you may actually want to have that a little bit less, let's say 1.1. What this means now is that you have a box that limits this to be uh, at the perfect distance always, but it maintains it like this. And it doesn't matter if you write an E or if you write an I, it will still look perfectly aligned to that side. So once you have that, then you can start to move this one to the other side here. And then you have the same thing, but you then may not want to have it as bold and as big. You may want to just have this regular and decrease that a little bit in size. But now you want it to be right adjusted instead. And that means that whatever you write here, say that this is an AAV5 uh, something like that, um, it maintains that adjustment always. And you can then do the same thing when you go down here. And then here, you can then uh, have the same, what did we say, regular. But now it's aligned to the top. And alignment, I can show that more easily if I move it up like this. Alignment uh, in the vertical axis, you do also in this text frame option. So then you go back to text frame options and you have your vertical justification and you go to bottom. So now you work with text frames that they are perfectly aligned to where you want it, regardless of it, how big this sorry how big this text frame is. So if you need to expand it here, it doesn't move your e, and it doesn't move the spacing to the edges, regardless if if I want to change the size to be much smaller later on. So it fits perfectly well where where you want this to be. So let's now say that this is. Uh, GFP, TH, something like that, double fluorescent. And you may then want to go in and just color code this. So then you can reuse your colors and you know that this is pseudotyped, uh, pseudo-colored, so that this one should be red. And the GFP actually is its own GFP, although it doesn't look very green on that here. So I'll just make this perfectly green and the same. So you want to do as much as possible on this single image first, because now when I have that, I can then reuse all of this to the others very easily, because I know that these ones will now perfectly fit down here. This one will fit, sorry about that. Apparently it's scaling. Um, and this will perfectly fit in the top corner, and this one will perfectly fit in the other corner. So now you created very quickly this correct viewing of all of this, and you can put those on top of here as well. Um, the trick is when you want to uh, change three different things here. So here you may have uh, something else you uh, want to put, and especially you don't want the text color to be this white anymore. If you have those selected, and you then go to your type tool, you can now actually start to adjust both the font and you can also adjust the text. So then you can start to adjust to say that all text, maybe it is fooling me because it's color. That normally works. Um, again, something you should test your demo. And then you can make all of that black. But because of this one had multicolor, you may then have to go in and actually adjust that one specifically. So, so now I have all my panels in the way that I think I like them to. And then you want to distribute these. Then you group all of that together, one by one here. And so you have your modules sitting like this. Then we go back to the great align tool that is in here in a sub, um, let me see where that is, sorry, here. And then you have your spacing. 
So here it works a little bit differently than in Illustrator. You don't have to select anything. You can have it like this that I want to have. Well, we said 1.5 millimeters in spacing. And now we have that perfect spacing. So then you can just go in there and say, I want to distribute this that way. And you have put in the, the first important piece of your multi panel. What I do then is just to copy these to the places where I want the other colors. So then I'll just move this one in here and move these guys over here. And why this is so good is that now I have the ability to just go in for each of these images, go to the links, and you have this called relink. Because this is just a reference to an image, you can then relink this image to the other one of your bright field images. So then I go to my control side of that one and place it. And you see that it now keeps all the same parameters that I put in. So all the scaling is the same. So it's correctly scaled to this one. And I can do the same thing here. I'll just relink this one to my immunofluorescence. That would be TH. And here I'll go and relink this one to my GFP. And same thing it can be done here. So that will be there. This one just happens to be black. Um, more of a boring version. So by doing that at the last stage, you now can have all of that already done. And now you see one other challenge which is maybe not apparent to people not working with um, the Substantia Nigra, but this one isn't very nicely oriented compared to this side. So they are twisted. But then you can use actually your rotation at this point by the direct tool and rotate this one. So you can then actually in here adjust this one exactly to where the other one is located. And you can move this one down. So by not having rotated or adjusted anything before, you have all that extra material that enables you to match these ones perfectly. So that, that's another reason why it's much better not to do all of these rotations and aspects before, but just do it once you see it with the boxes that you're working with. And then it's a trivial matter to just clean this one up, give this a, a B, C, D. And here, you'll just take away the part that's not important. Well, actually, it should be better to take the right one. And, of course, you want to get rid of your scale bars on these ones, but they are the right scaling. So just through that means, what you have created is a quite straightforward, quickly done image uh, montage. And you can view it down here, holding and pressing and go preview, and you see how the final will look. So this is the final with one exception. And that is when you scale in here, you see, well, are these really supposed to be high resolution images? They look quite bad in here. And that's because these are proxies. They are not your high resolution originals that it puts in. And you can view that if you either click on one specific one and right click, go to display performance, and you can go to high quality display. Then it shows you the original quality of that image. It doesn't change anything else, but it just shows you that image in the high quality version. And then you can uh, go back to say use the view settings and it uses the global setting. You can do the same thing by going into view and then say display performance, high quality display, and then it changes it to all, on all images. So then all of them you will see in their highest quality version. And then on, on top of this, of course, you then can add in other modalities of data and that you use also in the place command. So you place and then you can place in your illustrative files as well. So that works exactly in the same way that you get a file that you place in 
and you can scale this one then to be, uh, in this case I want it to be as two of these columns. And then I select these two and I see that they together are 57.5 millimeters. And I'll just scale this one with the correct reference there and get that one in. So then I put that in as another panel and you can place the last one in here. Put in this. And this one should then be sorry, 28 millimeters to me. So. And now you again can use this the same distribute tool to make sure that you have the correct spacing there. So is this uh, clear or are there any questions on that? Do you need to somehow embed them before you give them to someone else? Yes, exactly. So these are only linked in here. When when you want to send it out, there are two versions. The first version is to make this into a PDF file. So what you can do is then to just uh, make the uh, paper size into an A4 so you see where this would be placed. And you can maybe just center it all on the A4 size and export this. And when you export it to a PDF file, then you will retain all the links. So when I do that, Sorry, I should have just saved this on the desktop instead. So, so this exported file, I'll go into the details of export later on, but now you have everything linked into one PDF file. So there, there are no references, no risks of this being uh, lost, the references. However, it may come cases where you want to say, send the InDesign file so that people can work with it. There it's another tool that is called package. So when you choose this package, it saves the InDesign file with all the related links. And you can choose to have it so that it also includes your fonts. And then so you uh, can have all the images, all the fonts, everything in that package. And then you choose package. So I'll just save this one first um, on the desktop. So call it montage. And now I can make a folder where this is stored. So you copy the font, copy the linked graphics, and update the links to those graphics. And then I choose package. And then you have to agree that these fonts are used under special license. And now you create a folder. And this folder has a very sort of always the same internal structure. You have your original file, which is this montage, and you have all the fonts that are unique for what you have been using here. So these are the fonts that you need to be able to build that document. And you have the linked files in here. So these are the, a copy of your original files. So these are all the latest versions of all those files that are in there. And this is a great tool, I think, also to end when you have been working for a long time with the manuscript and when you're at the time to submit it. Do a package of those montages into a special folder that is that submission. Because then you know exactly what revisions of your images did you use for that submission and these things. And you can go back to that copy. So package is a really useful tool. When you put images into Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so, so embedding an image is not a great option in two ways. One is that it is stored within the file and it's, it's a, it uh, makes that file larger. But the other thing is that you cannot as easily edit the file. So in this case, I, I could have this file to be edited in its original software. It doesn't have to be edited in Photoshop or anything else. I can choose here in my link so let's see if I can say edit with and you see here it's all the uh, software that thinks that they can handle TIFF files. So I can actually here go and edit it in Office 2010 in Windows. Not that I would want to but I can do uh, editing in any special tool that you use for that 
image. You can't do that if it's embedded. Then it's much more restricted to what you can do. So uh, I would really uh, maintain it as links as much as you can. So what masking an image is actually what the images have been done here. So when you direct select an image, you see that that image is much larger and like this. But it has an outer, it has a mask that is this one. So that is actually a mask of that image that shows only the inner part. What, what you will see and become frustrated with is how badly Illustrator works with photos. It's really not a tool you want to use for uh, putting in photos and pixel-based graphics because this will be very invasive all the time and you will not get rid of the unmasked parts of an image in Illustrator. It can't, it can't uh, crop very well <coughs> images. So I would always suggest that when you have image data use in design for that part and add in Illustrator and they, it will be much cleaner to work. So this is the thing that this is now in itself resolution independent. So everything that's placed in here is just defining where the images should be and how large they should be. The, the place where you then go and define the resolution of the images is when you prepare it to export it to a PDF. Um, let's go into that um, because when you export this from InDesign for publication, you have two options. One is to create it as a PDF. That would be your first step to send out to uh, co-authors and to also maybe submit for your initial submission. And when you export a PDF, you first just give it a name, and we'll call this submission, and save it to desktop. And then you get all these parameters, and you can go into comp compression. So what this now does is that you can choose how you want to downscale the resolution of these images. So here you can now say, I want to make sure that these images are 300 dots per inch, so that if I have something that's overly huge, but I make it into a stamp size, I don't want to send the original data to my co-authors or for submission, because that would then be a multi-hundred megabyte files, and they wouldn't uh, enjoy that. So what you can now do is use the 300 dots per inch. And here, JPEG is actually a great compression, because it makes the images uh, really small, but you don't lose a lot of image information because it's only compressing once. And it's taking your original TIFF file and compressing that. So in here, you can then do that average down sampling on both of these. So let me just do that example that we can say high, which is still a very high quality of this. And you see that it crops image data to the frames. So anything that's outside my masking frames will be discarded. So there's no uh, sort of extra um, uh, unnecessary data being uh, generated into this PDF file. It's all in there. And here you can set your compatibility. Um, I normally say nowadays that you're rather safe going even with Acrobat 7, that so many people have that. I don't see the necessity to go to this top one, and especially not for submission to journals, because they have often quite old automated systems, and there it's even better to keep the 1.5. So I would do 1.5 PDF version for submission and 1.6 to colleagues. And why you want to go the higher is that the quality of the file and the compression rate is much higher the higher you go here. So the smaller the file can be. So just for this example, when you export that file, we now have a direct back-to-back -back comparison. So you, let me close this one. So you have your submission PDF and you have the mon montage up here. So the montage folder that contains everything in here is 14 megabytes. So it's still not huge, but it uh, has all your or original image data. And your submission file, sorry, if you go here, is then 852 kilobytes. So if you have uh, gone down from uh, 14 to 0.8 
megabytes just by doing that. But the, the PDF that you would submit to them is printing perfect. So you get all your image data in here that you would need to print it. But you see you don't have all the image resolution that I had in the original file here when you zoom it in. But when you print it in a single column in this size, it will print optimally. So 300 dots per inch is perfect when you want to print it, but if you want to show your colleagues be able to zoom in, you may want to maintain even higher, go to 600 dots per inch, something like that. So that's where your resolution comes in. It doesn't come in in InDesign until you export out of it. And that's where you want to make sure that you have 300 dots per inch. The other version is to generate the EPS file, and that's for the final submission. And then you have in the same, you have instead of choosing PDF, you choose EPS. But many of the questions are the same, and you can then choose to have the subset and which type of images you want to have in there. So that, that can work in the same way. So you can have the PDF for early submissions and to colleagues, but EPS in the end. Yes? Um, is there a difference between DPI and PPI? No, they are exactly the same. They are just, uh, they, they, they come from the, the, the different traditions, but they mean the same in this world. Oops, sorry. Um, so let's see. Now, the next thing we had on the schedule today is to think about the preparing figures for presentation. And there, I think we often stand and have two different things we want to do. One is to uh, take our own data and prepare presentations. But often, uh, we also need to take in data from other people and making quick but nice looking presentations. You have a journal club, you want to get that data in quickly. So there are some tricks that you may like to use when you're working with this data for your journal club. Let's say that one. And so I, I thought I'll take an example, just one article. Not to offend anybody else, I'll uh, just take one of my own. Um, let's see where I put that. So, you may just have a PDF uh, of an interesting article that you want to present. And when you have this uh, article, you may then want to do one or a number of things. So you see in this one, we have these composite montages somewhere. And here, you have photos in there. And I like these photos, I want to bring them out, but I really don't like all of these B-prime, uh, anything else in here. So I want to have the original images of this. And this really shows you where it's a value to make sure that you have your vector graphics all through. So when I zoom into this one, even though the images are submitted at 300 dots per inch, all the graphs are looking perfect in here because they are still ret retained as vector graphics. And that gives you this freedom to actually go in and extract these images. And that's where you would want to go into the Acrobat reader or the professional of Acrobat. So in Acrobat, it has changed a little bit over time, but you have a great tool that is normally hidden. And it's in here called Document Processing. And normally, you can't see that menu. You have to actually go in here and select it. So this is how it looks uh, without that menu available. But when you go to Document Processing, you have now the option to export all images. And when I export all those images, I can go to the desktop and save a new folder here. And just save all those images. So what it has done is now to give me all the individual images here. So they are the, the same in images that were in there, but they are without all the text on them. So now you can easily put in and annotate whatever you wanted to show on these guys. Of course, these are not very big because they are, were uh, printed quite small, but you can still get them out in the maximum possible resolution that you have in that PDF file. So that's the first tip how to get all the uh, pixel-based data out of your PDF quickly. So how about the, uh, the uh, graphs and data there? Well, that's where this place command in Illustrator is such a good tool. 
So if you just create a new uh, A4 and you choose place, you can then select the same PDF here. And I go to the place, let me see here, I may just want to have this timeline. And I, I get the page with the timeline. But, but because it uses all its own strange fonts, I use this tool of flatten transparency. And then you flatten it to a 100% vector with text to outlines and strokes retained. And then we, you have now the ability to clean this up just as we did prior to select all of it, uh, ungroup, um, and then in the path, clean up here. No cleanup was necessary. Then you can um, get rid of all the text. And I do that quickly with the direct selection tool and just delete those things. So you see, with the dry, direct selection, you actually may select some of your text sometimes. So then you just need to go in and clean that one up. And this, this guy's here. So with a couple of clicks, you now have actually the same quality as the original file as I submitted of this uh, timeline. So then you can extract all of these vector graphics directly out of that. Yes? No, exactly. So in some cases you will be unlucky. And I would do that experiment by exporting all the images first. And if they end up in the image folder here, you know that they were pixel-based. So then it's no value to go back and try to do that in Illustrator. But if they don't come up as one of the images here, then you may be in luck. And many of uh, the more high-impact journals, they push a lot of their, their authors and actually redraw a lot of things to maintain them in, in vector base. So it's, it's more and more in the newer journals or papers that you will get all of that in vector graphics. So then, then uh, the, that's the, the quick version of, of getting high quality. Uh, and you can then clean up, as I did here, get rid of lettering and other things. And especially if you have a nature paper, you may want to divide all the 24 panels into three, four panels. And you can do that quickly. What's not so easy then is to get this the best way into PowerPoint. And that's still one of those things where I do not understand Microsoft, why they are working in that way. If you work with Keynote, you're in luck because you can just save this as any type of Illustrator or PDF file. So we can call this figure one. And I'll just say that on the, the desktop. And then you can just straight away go in to uh, your keynote, white. And you can uh, place this one in here. So then you insert and you just choose that Illustrator file. So then you have the perfect quality file that you can scale up and down. It's tiny and it will always look great in there. In PowerPoint, the story is not as simple. So on the Mac, you have the ability to in, in, import and place PDFs also, as long as you use the docx format. So if you have this and you do a picture from file, and I'll import the same one from the desktop. It will actually look equally good. It, uh, it has the uh, issue that it actually doesn't crop it, but that's the main issue you have here. Otherwise, you can scale it. So let me, let me scale this one up so you can see that you retain the same quality there. So this works as long as you save it, this as a PPTX file. But would you save this as a PowerPoint file, it would destroy this image. So then it will not be a vector-based graphics anymore. So for Mac users, you can either use a, a Keynote and work with uh, these vector-based directly on, or use uh, PowerPoint, but only save it in uh, PPTX. So then you would think, well, the PPTX uh, file supports PDFs, Great, I can do that on Windows also, and I can send this to a Windows person. 
but you can't. So it's the same file format, but not really. So if you try to place a PDF in, in Windows, it will not look smooth at all. It will just show you the preview of that uh, PDF file. So in Windows, we have a completely different challenge because you cannot get in those vector graphics there. So what are you supposed to do then? Um, well, what, what you have to do is just to decide what's the biggest size I would want to present this in in uh, my PowerPoint file. So if I take the same one here, I now am thinking that, well, this is for a full A4, this may be a little bit small. So I'll just uh, scale this up, something like this. And then you can go in and save this for web. And so I wouldn't save it for Microsoft Office, though it's, it has a special menu for that, because those files are actually not very good in quality. The, the save for web gives you a better quality of this image. Um, so that's uh, another thing of those logical things. That Then you can save it as a PNG file. So what you now have done is actually to generate a pixel-based image again. So you lose all of your scaling possibilities there. And unfortunately, there's no way around that for, for PowerPoint in Windows. So there, if you, either if you don't know what computer it will be outputted on, or if, if you know that it will be on Windows, I would try to do this first. Although it's, it's surprising how good they can actually look also if you just save it as a PPTX file on the Mac and open it in Windows. It, they actually look quite okay as well. So that's the other alternative. But in Windows, make sure that you export it as a PNG file. And then you can have them transparent background as well and maintain as much quality as you can. So I think that's roughly where I was planning on this session. Um, any other questions that have come up during this time? Yes, yeah. No, you don't want to use that because that is really making it into pixels. So then you're uh, destroying your ability to, to actually uh, um, yeah, modify it in the future. So it's, it's really not something you want to use for your data if you don't have to. The reason, I think, could be cases where the complexity of what you're drawing is making your computer so difficult to work with that when adding all of these things. And that is normally an indication that you haven't simplified your drawings enough, that you're spending too much detail. Maybe you have a receptor that you're making 3D look and have drop shadows and all these things, and they are then uh, five millimeters high and you make a hundred of them then you may end up having this complexity that's too big. But so I would rather go back and simplify it than and rasterizing it if that's possible. Um, so those, and, and the anti-alias anti is, is a good thing to take up. So anti-alias is the way to make something look smooth even though it doesn't have the full resolution. So a vector graphics that you print in uh, 1200 dots per inch will look perfectly smooth. But if you make it into 72 dpi, if you don't have anti-alias, you will see these jagged edges. So that's where you need to make all of this anti-aliasing. And most fonts on your screen are doing that already. Um, for example, in this case, when you're viewing... Um, well, now I'm zooming in, so you can't really see that. Let's see how I can show it. Um, if we zoom this way. So this font is really smooth all through, e even when you go down he in here. And that's because the view here is anti-alias already. I don't know if you actually can turn that off anymore. Previously you could because it was... Maybe in preferences you can do that. When you turn it off. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, so where do you do it? So in general, yes. So if you turn that off, you now see 
all of these edges are jagged. <coughs> so this is the without the anti-aliasing. And as you say, it, it can really uh, be heavy on the software to do this on the fly all the time when you're zooming in and out. So that is actually a good uh, tip if you're working on a bit of a slower computer and you feel that Illustrator is really slowing down, then you can turn that off because it doesn't change anything in your data. You can always turn it on in the end when you want to see the full quality of that data again. Anti-aliasing is also something that is much less important on a high resolution screen like on the retina displays than it is on a lower resolution display. So if you use a retina display you may actually want to turn it off just because you have so many pixels to view there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it, there it's fortunate because, yes, it is. So then you can take the same file and I, I can just select this whole thing and group it. And I want to say that I want to scale this to 200%. And then it scales everything. Your text's proportion to the rest becomes the same. But you're not changing any of your image data because it's just a reference to that. So that's clearly where it's, it's great to maintain all your original data in those files because then you can just rearrange it and it's ready for your poster. Of course then you may want to uh, not to make this look like for uh, vision impaired people that you may want to decrease some of your, of your lettering. But that is a, a trivial matter to do later on then, that you can just go in and scale that. So that's just by using this scaling tool, you can adjust that to now make, make it almost a full size. Sure. This is another thing to keep track of. You have this inner circles now in, in design, which is, it looks like the focus plate of an old camera. And when you are clicking in this, regardless of where you're at, you actually start to move the photo that is in here. And it's, not seldom that that's not actually what you wanted to do. So I find this one a little bit too big, the uh, circle in there. It's too easy to hit because it may be so that I just want to move, um, if I ungroup this whole thing, I just want to move this panel. But if I click anywhere close to here, it uh, then turns into the hand and it moves the image. So you want to make sure that when you move that, that you just take outside that center part. Any other questions or comments? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I can show that li a little bit. So it's it's a very easy thing, and it's actually the way that our program was made here. So maybe I can just show you how that one was done. It's the easiest way because I know where those files are. So. What, what you then have is the preliminary schedule here. And w when I work with InDesign and I know I want to get it in, I normally work in the outline mode in Word. I don't know how many of you work with this, but this has the hierarchical view. So if you have your um, layer uh, level one here is your level one of your uh, heading. So that will be your biggest one. And then it goes down level 2, level 3, level 4, and so forth. And you can then minimize these to hide a full day and things like this. So this is a very simple text document where you have then all of these levels of headings here. And when you want to do that into uh, in design document, you start then with an A4 document, for example. And in this case, you want to work with a multi-page document. And then I could say, I don't want to have this facing, but I think this will fit into a two-page document. And when, when you have done that, now the uh, margins were a bit on the tiny side, so I'll just go in with margins and columns. And I like my one-inch uh, margins there. And let's go back to the previous page. So in pages... 
interesting it only created a page two let me make a new one uh, yes I said starting page number not the number of pages sorry about that let's just make this into a4 and one inch so with text you actually um, generate text boxes first so you can generate a text box that sits on page he uh, one here and now you see you have something in this corner that's a square there this is making linking between text boxes. So when I click that one, you see I now have an icon that follows my text flow. And I put that on the next page here. So that means that any text I put in the first text box will flow to the next one. And they don't have to be on different pages. It could be column one, column two, column three on a poster. And you just link them. And anything you place into this text box will flow <coughs> between. So then I, with the text, I do the same way that I place. And I'll go back to this um, the document that were in documents here. So I have my uh, preliminary schedule uh, Word document. And there you want to show your import options. So what this can do now is that it actually can import the styles that you had in Word. So you can say that you want to import them and you want to either use the ones that are in in design or redefine the ones that are in in design. So I may like my word uh, styling that I did, so I just redefine them in uh, in design the first time. But then I may say once they already exist, I may then use the ones that are there. So now I made uh, an import that I can import uh, again and again and then just place that in here. So So now it flows automatically between the two pages here. And what is the uh, real value of working with these different uh, styles? Well, it is because now you can go in and say in my window and type, I have my, sorry, there, my, I have my paragraph styles. And now it has imported all those heading styles that I had in the previous document. So I may go in and say that, well, this heading has way too much spacing below. I want to decrease that one. Well, above, sorry. So now I have a heading that is much nicer. I right click on that one, and then I say that I want to, sorry about that. I should say redefine. Didn't that work? Hmm. That's typical when you want to show something quickly, it didn't work. Um, you're, you're supposed to be able to re redefine this once you have, yes. So it did work on the heading three. And you say redefine style. And then it changes all the paragraphs that have this uh, style three. So I may want to have this one not to be bold, but actually the re uh, regular one. And then I redefine that there. And then you see that it, it changes all of those. So then once you have done that, I can go back to Word, change in that Word file, and then replace this text by placing it again. And now it, because it has all of that in it, it will now, when it uh, exchanges this, it will use the InDesign styles. So that was the idea, at least. Yes. So, so that's the key thing when you have a very long document, that you can have the styles and work with it in, in Word. You can have your EndNote references automatically updated, and then just replace the text in a long document. And it will reflow all the way through here. And uh, so that can be two pages, 100, or and it can have chapters and all these things as well. So, so that's a another convenient tool. Yes. Yes. It is. So what you can do then is to actually work with your page templates. Um, and that's also, sorry, I shouldn't have closed that document. If you just make a new document. 
So you have up in here, you have your masters. And in your master, you can prepare a template for each page. So if you want the text box in all pages, you can put it in your master. And you can put your footer and all of these things there as well. So then it will come on all pages. So that's, that's clearly an alternative to do.